This is George Gilbert. We're on the ground at Databricks with the creators of Spark. We have now with us Joseph Bradley, who's the principal behind machine learning and graph processing and graph algorithms um, at, uh, at Databricks um, and the 2.0 release. So, Joseph, um, let's start with Spark machine learning and, and how it's differentiated from other approaches. Mm -hmm. Let's start from the point of view of it, the sweet spot of its use cases. Sure, uh, that's a great question. And I'd say this, the real sweet, the, the very obvious sweet spot, of course, of machine learning on Spark, I'd say, would, first thing everyone would think of would be scalability, of course. Um, traditional machine learning libraries, of course, tend to be built often even for a single core from the beginning, whereas with Apache Spark's library, it was designed for you know, distributed computing. And that's partly taking advantage of all the work which uh, the other people you've spoke with today uh, have contributed to um, in terms of being built off of RDDs and data frames and so forth. Uh, but also just sometimes the machine learning algorithms themselves do need to be architected correctly from the beginning to, to really scale out. Okay, so for, from my understanding, there are, there are actually algorithms that don't really lend themselves to, to parallel processing. And, but it sounds like um, for the other ones, Spark or Databricks um, has done the homework of creating a data structure, in, in the case of RDDs or data frames, to make the parallel parallelization of algorithms that can be scaled out possible. Right. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that with certain algorithms, it's very straightforward to scale them out. Uh, with others, it requires quite a bit of work. And I think in all cases, uh, with some thought, you're able to do, you know, take certain steps forward to scale out. Okay. And um, that's, but it's certainly benefited from the underpinnings. Yeah, the other thing yeah. which uh, I did want to add about like what is exceptional about Spark's approach to machine learning is that it is meant to offer the same implementations and APIs and algorithms uh, from multiple languages. And I think this really has been one of the big barriers in machine learning, where a lot of people who are best at machine learning may be used to something like R, maybe Python, whereas maybe the people at uh, companies who are best at, say, deploying it in production may need to operate in, say, the JVM you know, or, or other frameworks. OK, I want to hold that thought sure. because we're going to come back to the, the ability to go from design to production. Um, and that's a big differentiator. But let's come back to the scalability because yes. I've talked to you know, a bunch of companies. And I've actually only come across a couple, we'll leave names aside, who believe they can do um, scale out uh, machine learning. Right. And others are emphasizing other things like um, usability of the pipeline and sure. that sort of thing. Um, so if, if you have a couple other vendors who can do scale out mm -hmm. um, eventually, you know, who are doing right. the work, then what are the other differentiators you're gonna bring to bear? Definitely. So uh, I will separate there, right, Apache Spark from Databricks, where, yeah, definitely with Apache Spark, like multiple vendors are contributing to it, and a lot of work has been done to scale out there. Okay. I think the real challenge for a data scientist um, or someone wanting to do machine learning is not just in having that good implementation of the algorithm, but in having all of the operations which need to surround it, being able to sort of have self-service, very accessible uh, cluster management, creation, scaling, uh, monitoring, checking out logs, all of that, which is so important for uh, facilitating that scale-out machine learning. And there, I think, like the ease of use in Databricks is just amazing. <laughs> OK. Yeah. So let's take a look at perhaps the, the life cycle of a model where, where you were alluding, you know, to, um, you know, it's not just scaling it out, mm -hmm. but let's take let's talk about um, uh, where we want to do uh, online learning. So we're we're getting data feedback, you know, or feedback loops right. in the form of, um, uh, I guess, the ac accuracy of the predictions. Um, how will that work? both online and, and in batch mode? 
Right. Um, that's a great question. And uh, there are currently many answers out there which different, I think, both researchers and companies have tried. Um, of course, you were talking with Michael earlier about structured streaming, and that's a case where I think we have a real opportunity to really mesh those two modes together in terms of usability and the API, where uh, being able to fit on a batch data set and on a stream of data um, should really be very intuitively similar okay. uh, for a user. And that's a case where, in terms of the API, we've been preparing for it in terms of uh, modifying Apache Spark's MLlib in order to use data frames and data sets as input. And then in terms of the implementation, that's something which uh, here at Databricks we've been thinking a lot about in terms of how to take advantage of structured streaming to do that implementation and do those online updates. Okay, so, and, and, and that's what gives you, if, if you're using structured streaming, you get both the online and the batch um, modalities, is that right? Certainly now with, for example, data frame and SQL queries. Yeah. Uh, with respect to machine learning right now, in Apache Spark, uh, it's really just the batch mode. Um, okay, it's just right. you haven't gotten around to the... As far as doing the online learning. Yeah. And once you fit your model, you can certainly go ahead and deploy it to make predictions but, using but streaming right learning. now. But not the learning. But that's a roadmap thing. That's definitely something which we are, yeah, think is super valuable and a okay. lot of people will benefit from. Yeah. Now, um, uh, in terms of sort of agility, the ability to... Uh, sort of rapidly test and evaluate right. the models as they're, because uh, I don't assume, you know, it, just because they're online learning doesn't mean they become the production model. They have to go through a, a process. Right. What does that process look like now and what might sure. it look like in a more automated world? Uh, that's a great question. I think there are a couple elements to that. Um, and. Those elements will depend a lot on whether you're expecting to you know, deploy a new model every minute or every day. And we can come back to that later, but okay. I'd say sort of two big questions there. One, first just in terms of uh, operations, how do you get that model into production? And second, how do you verify that you know, that's the model you want and you really do want it answering queries in real time? Oh, no, well, I assume that you actually do those two in the opposite order. That it's a good question. And really both happen. Oh, okay. Where as far as moving it into production, um, that's something which, uh, for example, with Spark right now, is very doable in terms of, say, deploying in a structured streaming setting uh, or using DStreams from earlier versions of Spark. Um, as far as... Uh, deciding whether or not you want to actually have that model going um, to be making your main predictions for your application or what have you. Um, there are multiple ways to do that. You can certainly simulate offline behavior uh, or online behavior offline to make a decision. You can also, for example, uh, like ideally do um, a deployment where you do a bit of A-B testing before you really put it as your main model. So this so is sort is, of the... But well, it sounds like both of those, sorry to interrupt, but it sounds like sure, sure. both of those are super, almost supervised. Like the A-B testing, right. I mean, ultimately someone's gonna look at the answers. Right. Although maybe further out, they don't have to. That's a good question. So <laughs> um, bringing up the, the question of like, what can be supervised and what needs to be done either in an unsupervised way or in a supervised way offline later um, is a great question. And that, that really is very dependent on your application. Um, but the question of like how to move your model into production and also a lot of the infrastructure around monitoring um, can be shared, I think, in both of those uh, domains, supervised and unsupervised. Now, and by monitoring, you mean the sort of the evaluation of the accuracy? Right. Okay. And to see if how behavior changes, right, as you move from one model to another. Okay. Yeah. Oh, like put up a shadow one, you know, if it, it, it sort of off, uh, simulated, 
And if it doesn't work, sort of right. roll it back. That is a common practice, right? Okay. So, as, and then part of your question was like, how is that done now, and how could I imagine it being done in yeah. sort of the ideal way in the yeah. in the future? Um, there are multiple ways right now, um, and I think the big divisions there are one: Are you deploying within Apache Spark, um, where you may be say deploying either in a batch context? with, say, scheduled jobs, or would you be deploying in, say, a streaming, um, uh, say, with structured streaming? And so if you're deploying within uh, Apache Spark, like that is very straightforward. We provide ways to persist ML models, uh, load them back, even across languages, and so forth. If you need to deploy the model outside of Apache Spark, um, there are a few options. There are some limited PMML export, um, there is also um, there are also efforts, though, which I think are really going to change how things are done, uh, where we're collaborating. Databricks, we Databricks are collaborating with some other uh, open source contributors to get sort of local implementations of models into open source Apache Spark, where those would be able to make very fast predictions without actually doing data frame or RDD operations. So I think that will be really exciting as far as the, the uh, sort of operational aspect of oh, deploying. Model serving without all the richness of the Spark engine. Right. Just take the, essentially the metadata about the model, the JSON and the Parquet you know, mm. features, JSON metadata, Parquet features, and, right. and then let someone else execute, you know, it says, I need this type of model, mm -hmm. you know, make, go use the one in C sharp or whatever and, you know. That's, that's the hope where it would be easy to say, have your, you know, web application running, which needs to be a very light, like quick application, right. not touching Spark, um, and being able to deploy a model trained within Spark in such an application. And that could potentially be at the edge for IoT uh, scenarios. Definitely, that would be a that would be very important there. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, let's uh, take a break uh, right now, and we'll come back with more on uh, making data scientists productive, um, which is today the most manual part of machine learning. Uh -huh.